Hello, how y'all doing today? My name is Bernie Thompson and I'll be your instructor for this course, The Pressure is On. This course will cover the use of pressure transducers for testing the internal combustion engine. A pressure transducer is any device used to convert energy from one form to another. Pressure transducers read a physical quantity and from this produce an electrical signal. Pressure transducers will need a power source, a ground source, and will produce a voltage output or a signal that's proportional to the physical applied quantity. We all know what a pressure transducers are. We have them on engines, such as the manifold absolute pressure sensor or the MAP. This will need a power ground and it will produce a voltage output signal that's proportional to the pressure within the induction system. This output will be scaled in voltage. So basically we will have a voltage output from such a sensor and it will need to be converted into the actual pressure. Since we have voltage, voltage is only indicative that there was some pressure changed or moved, but we would need to know what that voltage means in pressure. Each type of pressure transducer that you will use is going to have a different scale. And that means that this will need to be converted into the pressure or normalized. To normalize the voltage into pressure, you'll have some type of a mathematical equation, which is right up here, or we can have the voltage in a chart and we can read, let's say 1.1 volts is 86.9 PSI. Be aware that if you are using a snap-on, pico, fluke, or an ATS, each one of these will have a very different reading here. So if I was going to use a ATS sensor on a snap-on, you couldn't pick the pressure transducer for the unit. In other words, I would just use the voltage and scale it over. If you pick the voltage, then we're going to have a problem because it will not be accurate. The scales that are written inside the control or the scope will be different for each pressure transducer. Therefore, if you picked a 300 pound pressure transducer in a snap-on, that scale would be very different than a 300 pound pressure transducer picked in an ATS scope. One other sensor that we might use is a Fluke PV350. This pressure vacuum module works very well but it has a very low output. So one millivolt per unit of measure is one PSI or one unit of measure. So what that would mean is if I had 50 PSI, that would be equal to 50 millivolts. Now in an engine idle, I would expect the engine to run basically 40 to 70 PSI. So that's 40 to 70 millivolts. This is a very low reading. So if you're using this type of sensor with your scope, always make sure that you have a very low setting, like 0.5 volts. Now what that's going to give you is the vertical resolution will be correct to read this type of a sensor. So in other words, this type of sensor is going to have very small output. The scope that you're using, it's going to be scaled for a little bit different application. Most scopes in the automotive field are 8-bit. That means that I would have 250 discrete points or levels. So if I pick 20 volts, now that's 40 volts because all scopes would be plus or minus. So that's plus or minus 20, that's a 40 volt scale. I would have 156.25 millivolts per per unit of measure. In other words, you have to have more than 156 millivolts to even see it move. So if you add it on 20 volts, you couldn't even get a reading from your fluke. So rather than picking a 20 volt scale, you're going to need to pick a 0.5 volt or lower, and then that would be one volt. Now, if you're using an ATS scope, ATS has the highest resolution bitwise at 65,536. So if I added on a 40 volt scale, I'd have 0 0.061 millivolt per uh, division. That means that we would easily see a fluke pressure transducer on a higher scale. Just be aware that all the other scopes, they're not going to have that type of bit resolution. So we definitely want to have a very low uh, setting 
for your voltage when using this. Now the fluke in this, in this illustration, I'm going to see that the fluke is in yellow and I'm going to see the red is an ATS sensor. Now, when you first look at these, they might look very different, but that would be an incorrect assessment of this. These are both giving you the same data, except one is scaled bigger because such as an ATS sensor, that is a zero to four volt scale. Well, a fluke is a zero to 0.500 or a half a volt. Since that's the case, we would have to zoom in on this to see it. So if I took this and I scaled this and we changed the multiplier 11 times on channel one right here, and that's this guy in yellow, now you can see that that information that was displayed is the same as what we had before. So in other words, an ATS or a Pico or a Snap-on is going to have about the same uh, scaling you've got to have a multiplier. So in this case, the Fluke and the ATS carry very similar types of information. And the pressure transducers that will be used will usually be a piezo sensor. The capacitive sensing is another type of sensor that is in the automotive industry. You can also have Hall effect potentiometer and magnetoresistive element. The most popular type of sensors used in the automotive for this application would be a piezo sensor. A piezo material is really an effect that if I put pressure on the piezo material, it will have an output. Now, if I put pressure on it and I have a current path going through it, it will give me resistance because it is outputting a voltage and the voltage output will be resistance based on the current that's flowing through it. So I could build two different type of piezo sensors. I could have one that is a current based where it's a resistive element base, or I could have one where it's a piezo output type sensor. We'll cover these. The two type basically is an electric field based output and a mechanical strain based output. Um, a mechanical strain base is also referred to as a pulse sensor, a delta sensor. These will be different in the way that we're going to use these type of sensors. Here's a very good example. So if I took a vacuum pump and I have both sensors, the yellow trace is the ATS pressure sensor and the red trace is a Nicholson pulse sensor. It's a very good pulse sensor. So basically is what this is going to do is we can see every time I pump the pump, I can see a change. But what's really different between the ATS and the Nicholson is that notice that I have a zero plane with nothing applied. Now I pumped it once and the Nicholson, the delta type sensor had an output or delta being difference. So it shows the difference, but then it returns as soon as that first pull is up, it returned to a zero place. Now the ATS sensor will pull up and it actually gives me the vacuum concentration, which is 3.5 volts. The Nicholson will always return back to zero and it only shows the main effect, the first major pull that I have, where a type of sensor like a Pico Snap-on or ATS sensor will show me an overall change. Now, many times I'm more interested in, do I have vacuum in the motor? Well, with this type of sensor, a Nicholson or a first look, these type of sensors will not give me that type of data. They'll only give me the database that I had to change. But I want to know when I get into a system, do I have a correct vacuum? In other words, does the engine have 18 inches of vacuum or does it have seven inches of vacuum? When you use a pulse style sensor, a delta sensor, you don't have that data. You only see the difference. So in my mind, I'm always looking for an actual sensor that will give me some type of data on what I really have contained in the system. Now, this is the difference of the intake. So the yellow would be the ATS intake sensor or a minus 30 inches of mercury and the red is a pulse sensor. Now the pulse sensor is very big as we can see from the top to the bottom. But really 
The same data is contained in this sensor. All I would need to do is I'm going to need to change something. I'm going to need to pick a multiplier. So I'm going to put that on one. I'm going to multiply it by, by 14.7 and I'm going to zero it. Now is what's going to happen is you can see that these two waveforms, the red and the yellow, the yellow being a regular traditional type sensor, can make a pulse type sensor output. Now that's very beneficial because now when I don't multiply this, I'll see what the actual vacuum state would be on the engine. And if I want a pulse sensor, I just get a bigger amplitude. I multiply that. And now we have a big signal if that's what you want to see on your scope. So just be aware that both sensors will work as a pulse sensor if that's what we're requiring to be used. Again, here's another waveform. You can see that they're very similar in their amplitudes and their makeup. The strain gauge style PSO is where I have resistors across, and this is a Wheatstone bridge, and I'm putting current pass through this. As this is deflected or bent, when I bend this, it makes an output. This output will change my signal. And so basically, these will be a style that has a vacuum chamber connected down here. So this is referred to as absolute. Now I'm comparing this atmosphere or the pressure side out here against a, an absolute vacuum. Now an, an absolute vacuum is where I've removed atmosphere. Atmosphere at sea level is 14.7 PSI. Once I remove all the volume from that, and there's no volume left, that will put it into a vacuum. Now this will deform and it will press against this vacuum and this pressure up here. And when I strain these with current flowing through, I will get an output type sensor from this. So basically this just makes an output from an applied pressure. The other style that I have, can use is a capacitive capsule sensor. Now this is where I have two plates and the size of these plates and the distance between here, referred to as the dielectric being changed, will change the output of the sensor. So in order to make this type of sensor work, I'm going to put it in a housing. Now this inside here is going to be pulled down into a vacuum, so this will be referred to as an absolute pressure sensor. Now when I put a pressure in here, whether that's atmosphere, lower or higher, it's going to change the distance between these two plates because this will bend. And when this little thing bends in, these plates become closer together or they become further apart. And that will change the capacitance or the output of the sensor, and that's what I'm reading. Now, both of these type of sensors, a strain gauge and a capsule capacitive sensor, are used in the automotive industry. You see MAP sensors that are used in both. So if you see some of the type of capacitive capsules um, Ford would have one, a B-map would be a Ford, and you see those put out a digital frequency in a vehicle. And you would see strain gauge sensors that would be used as MAP sensors. So again, both of these type of sensors we're all familiar with. The sensor's construction is one to where I have a, a, a hole in the bottom of the sensor that comes up, and this is a diaphragm. Now this diaphragm is going to be very important because the thicker or thinner that is means that I have better, um, it moves quicker and follows the pressure changes better. Now the one thing I want you to notice is right here, this is a microprocessor. And that microprocessor there processes this data and when we build these, these diaphragms will all be slightly different and we program this so we can have an accurate reading from the sensor. Now why I'm talking about this is because when these are in use, you need to make sure that you keep the pressure transducer away from any ignition signal. In other words, I'm going to take the coil out to use these in, in cylinder pressure testing, and I want to make sure that when I do that, I ground the coil so I don't get this hit. Many times, if the spark jumps up, it'll put a hole from the high discharge voltage, 50,000 volts basically, from the ignition coil. That will damage the sensor instantly, so we always want to be careful of that. 
That diaphragm, this is a diaphragm out of a one of these um, sensors. And you can see that this is the type of sensor that we showed earlier, where this is a strain gauge and it will, uh, a current path will be going down and this will add resistance and the resistance will make an output change from the sensor. This is about the same size as a number two pencil eraser in diameter. These are very small sensors. Now, most pressure transducers will have a minimum of greater than five times burst pressure. That means that if I was using a 300 pound pressure transducer in the cylinder, that would give me 1500 PSI. Well, a lot of times sensors even have more than five times. Now you gotta to start to think about this in the thickness of the diaphragm. The thicker the diaphragm or the more times burst pressure that I have, the thicker this diaphragm becomes. Now when I get the diaphragm too thick, it just doesn't have a good communication with the pressure changes. So the pressure changes will be dampened by this and I do not want that. So it's always really important to pick the size pressure transducer that you actually need. So a 300 pound pressure transducer would be used for gasoline base and a 500 pound would be used for a diesel. There are applications for gasoline that will be over 300 and then we would use a 500. But we always want to scale the pressure transducers appropriately. That means that I'll have more information communicated from the pressure changes. As we will see through this presentation, the lighter diaphragms will have a much more accurate movement in the negative state of pressure. Remember, you're going up to 300 pounds, but you don't have that on a vacuum side in a cylinder. So what we really want to do is look at the vacuum pockets for light deformation to see if valves are seeding. That means I really want a 300 pound for a gas based engine and a 500 pound based for a diesel engine. It will make it work better. If the running compression test of a gasoline engine was taken with a 5000 PSI transducer, the peak voltage would fall under 200 millivolts. That's two tenths of a volt. If the same test was done with a 300 pound pressure transducer, the peak voltage would fall at 3000 millivolts. That's three volts. So this resolution gain is over 15 times. Again, this is just showing you that the you really need to scale the pressure transducer for what the application is going to be using and you'll have better success in using these. Pressure transducers read a physical quantity. So I could read the exhaust pressure, the intake pressure, cylinder pressure, crankcase pressure, power steering pressure, brake pressure, transmission pressure, oil pressure from the engine, we could also do uh, fuel handling and containment systems or fuel vapor. We could do air conditioning systems. Really anything that is a closed system, we could get readings from. Now the difference between a pressure transducer and just looking at the pressure, let's say on a gauge, is this will actually give me a waveform and inside the waveform, there's gonna be additional data that I need. These pressure transducers will be scaled in different ways. So what we're looking for here is we want an absolute sensor. That's where we have a zero pressure inside that to where we've looked at them already to where they're in a negative state of pressure or a vacuum. Every All the pressure or the atmosphere has been removed and now I'm reading from a zero plane. This is really what you're looking to use. We don't want to use a gauge or a differential. The gauge pressure would be such as I am not reading the atmospheric pressure. So I live in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and we're a mile high, 5,500 feet. So at sea level, you would have a pressure basically of 14.7. Where I live, you have 12.2, 12.3 PSI. So I would have a difference of pressure, but I could not see that pressure with a gauge. The gauge only reads from atmosphere, where an absolute pressure sensor will read that difference in my elevation. And that's really what we're looking for. A differential pressure sensor, these are reading just the difference between two ports. You might see these type of differential sensors on a Ford system 
where I have a EGR system being read. They're going to take a pipe for the EGR and they're going to open a valve up and the flow will be established through the pipe. Inside the pipe, I take a washer or a restriction. I weld that washer inside the pipe. And as that flow increases, I'll have a higher pressure on one side and a lower pressure on the other. The higher the flow rate becomes, the more pressure differential I will obtain between the two sides of the washer. That will be read with a differential style sensor, and then I'm really not worried about an absolute or gauge. I'm only worried about the difference between the two sides, such as in a EGR system, as we've illustrated for a Ford. That would be a different type of system that would use this. Now, when we're doing these compression tests in the internal combustion engine, we always want to make sure that we do all the tests and be aware that each one of these tests will have its own rules that we'll cover during this class. So a crank no start will have a different rule set than an engine running at idle. And an engine running snap, that's where I'm at idle and I snap the throttle wide open, will have a different set of rules than the crank no start or the engine idle. And when I let off of the snap, and I rev the motor to, let's say, 3,000 RPM when I snapped it, now the engine decel will occur, and that's going to have a different set of rules. So really be aware that the pressure is what you're reading, and during each one of these uh, tests, the pressure states within that cylinder are going to change, and it's going to change the rule base that we're going to use. Now, the other thing that I want to warn you is don't skip steps. We do a lot of online help for the customers that we have. They'll call in and they want help with using these pressure transducers. Now, what I've seen is that they'll think that they're just going to check the cam timing so they just have an engine run. But you always want to provide yourself with a crank no start and an engine idle, a snap, and a decel. Along with these tests, we also need a pressure transducer in the induction system, a pressure transducer in the exhaust, and we want to make sure that we have an ignition event for the cylinder that we're in. Now, once we do all of these, then you will be successful in this. If you're trying to flat rate it, and you just run out and you get one of these tests with one sensor, you're hurting your own effort. You really are. You really need to have three pressure transducers in the engine at one time, and we're going to compare these sensors against each other, as I will cover during this class. The compression hoses will also be very important to understand. The compression hoses can change your pressure maybe up to 15 to 25 PSI. So if I had, let's say I wanted to use two pressure transducers and I didn't have the same hoses and I use different hoses from bank to bank. One bank might appear to have up to 25 pounds difference and that could be in the hose itself. So when we use a hose like the ATS hose, this is a stainless steel braid hose that takes very high pressures and heats and doesn't have deformation. Some of these other hoses they will deform under heat and pressure and they will increase volume and it will change the pressure. Now, more than saying you need any kind of hose, you just need to be aware that if you're using two different hoses and one bank has a lower pressure, peak pressure than the other bank, switch the hoses and make sure that it's an actual cylinder problem and not a hose style problem. So when we're actually doing this and we have a V-style engine or maybe an inline and we're doing two cylinders, I want to always be sure that once I test these that I'm going to switch these so I make sure that the hose isn't affecting my reading. Just be aware that that can happen because it absolutely does. We also have different type of pressure transducers. So we have a fluke style here that we've talked about. We have a Pico and we have an ATS Pressure Pro system. Is what the difference will be is in this pressure transducer right here, this is going to use a nine volt battery in here. 
And this battery is going to give a power and a ground, so I have a current pass so I could make a voltage output from this. This has a rechargeable battery in the Pico, and again, we have a current path so we can have an output. On Snap-on and ATS sensors, they need an external power and ground, so this is going to be something that's going to plug in, and this box will give you a power so you can use three pressure transducers, but in this system, we could use this on an Autel, a Snap-on, a Pico, and now we have the best of all worlds. I can use three sensors at one time, and that's really going to be what's going to be beneficial, as you're going to see, we're going to want to do that. Um, the ATS scopes have pressure ports in the back of the scope. So if I plug in the pressure sensor, it will automatically give a power and ground and get a reading from that. So it's just very beneficial and it's easier to use pressure transducers. The system was made for automotive use. The engine, I'm going to start the engine. So if I start an engine and I allow it to idle, I want to point out this is going to be an idle style waveform and so each waveform will have its own characteristics and we need to be very aware of that. Now this is our waveform here and we're going to see that we have a pressure that's going to come up and it's going to peak at the top and that is the point to where the piston has come as close as it physically can to the head. Now the piston is going to move away from the head on the stroke down, which we would refer to as a power stroke, and we come down and we have this pocket. Now this is the exhaust pocket, and the exhaust valve opens, and when it opens, I change the state in the cylinder, and then we have this as an atmospheric pressure, and that would be during the exhaust, and then we have an intake valve opening, pulling it into a negative state of pressure. I come across and I close the intake, we go bring the piston back up close to the head, top dead center, and then we go back down on our, uh, we're going to call that decompression. Now I know that we talk about this being a power stroke, but for the remainder of this course, we didn't make power because the, the spark plug is removed. I will cover this waveform in some detail and in depth. But this is an idle, and you see how repetitious it is. Each one time that the piston comes up to top dead center, on compression, I will have a peak, a peak there. And I'll have another time that I come to top dead center right here, but this is during the exhaust, and I do not make a lot of pressure. The exhaust valve is open, so that is pushing the exhaust or scavenging it into the exhaust. Again, we will cover this in some detail. What I want to do right now is I want to take one of these waveforms right here and I want to get my zoom window and I want to just put a zoom around here so we can get a zoom on this. If your scope doesn't allow you some type of a zoom feature, you really need to upgrade that scope to something more modern. We really need to be able to see these and to zoom in on them. Now once I zoom in, I'm going to take a cursor and I'm going to put it right through the peak and I'm going to take my other cursor and I'm going to put it through this peak. Now I want to look at the time. So whenever I put a cursor for cursor on whatever scope you're using, I'll have a period in time. In this case, I have 167 milliseconds. So this is 157 milliseconds of time. Now, in order to find my strokes, if my scope doesn't allow a gridding mechanism, I want to use this. It's a very simple math equation where I'm going to take the 150 milliseconds and I'm going to multiply it by 0 0.25, 0 0.50, and 0.57. Now, when I do this, it's going to give me an output. In other words, if I take 150 167 milliseconds by 0.25, that's 25%. That's 50%. That's 75%. That will give me my exhaust stroke, my intake stroke, and my compression stroke. So here, if I have this marked and we multiply that, I have 42 milliseconds basically. So now I'm going to mark that and I'm going to put my other cursor at 42. Now that's bottom dead center. So I went from top dead to bottom dead. Then is what we're going to do is the next math, and we get 83 milliseconds. Now that's top dead. 
So that's one complete revolution of the crankshaft at that position. Now I do three quarters and I have 125 milliseconds and now we're back down to bottom dead. So we went from top dead to bottom dead to top dead to bottom dead and then we would go back to top dead. This gives me my stroke locations so we'll have no problem finding these type of uh, locations because we're going to need them. For the remainder of this course, we will do a marking system to where I put a cursor through this system and one through this uh, tower. So both compression towers will have a cursor put through the peak and then I'm just going to push a mark cam button. Now the first one is top dead, bottom dead, top dead, bottom dead, top dead. These little marks down here are 30, 60, 90. So they're in 30 degree increments. Now is what this is going to do is it's going to give me a way to gauge when the exhaust valve opened, when the intake valve opens, and when the intake valve closes. So now I have a method in which I can find my camshaft timing, which will be very important when diagnosing the modern engine. The exhaust camshaft timing, for those of you that have done any kind of performance work, this is a performance style cam here. And what we've got, or this is, I apologize, this isn't a performance cam, this is a normal cam and a card. But this cam card is for a normal car, but when you normally see these type of cards, they're for performance engines, that's what I was indicating. So basically is what we want to do is we want to look at where this valve is opening and where this valve is closing, and that's going to give me my duration. Now these are going to be measured in different ways that I'll cover shortly, but that gives me an idea of what this is. This is the cam card for the intake, and it's going to tell me how far I open the intake valve before top dead center, and when I close the valve after uh, the bottom dead center position. So this is the time that the intake valve is open, and again, this duration will be given at different ways on a card that we definitely will talk about here shortly. Now basically, this card is showing where both valves are open at the same time, the intake valve opened before top dead center, and the exhaust valve also is closing about this time. Now when the exhaust valve is in its closing period and the intake is in its opening period, the distance between these two factors gives me my overlap, and the overlap will do a certain tendencies of an engine to run. I'll speak of these shortly. But this is what would normally be seen. You don't usually see these type for application cards for normal style street driving engines. But for race engines, when I put, buy a performance cam, this is the type of card or the type of indication that will be given with my cam so I can better understand what kind of performance this cam was designed for. Now, if I take the card, and this is another way to show the card, and it's going to show the card, and I want to point out this opening, 0 .050, this is a 50 thousandths opening. So I would want the valve, the actual valve opening off of the seat, 50 thousandths, and then I'm going to measure when that valve opened, and then we're going to open the valve all the way, and we're going to see when it closes. The same will be done on the intake. And what we're looking at is when these valves open and when they close. Now, remember that we're doing this at 50 thousandths, and I'll explain why we do this shortly, but right now that's a target. Now, I want to show you another one that's the advertised duration, and this is at 6 thousandths of tappet. Now, that means that this is given at 6 thousandths of valve opening. Now, this one also is the same thing, or this is at 50 and this is at 6. So one of these planes is different than the other. So these are going to be really crucial when you're looking at cam cards to figure out which one of these you have. Again, I will explain this shortly. Now, the cam lobe centers, so if I have a tight lobe, I'll have a 106 to a 109 center, that's this angle right here. So if I took an angle through the, the 
center of the toe, and if this is the same, and I do that over here, I would have a wide angle, and this is a 110 to 118. Again, these are stop performance style camshafts. And this, from going from a 106 to a 118, will make a huge performance change on your engine. Now, what I can do with modern engines is I can phase these cams. And with phasing the cam, that's where I would have two camshafts and I could move one in relation to the other. So this time, this red cam right here is the exhaust, and I can see that I could phase it from over here to over here. Now, do you see how I'm changing the overlap here? And again, on the intake cam over here in blue, and right here, I'm going to change this. So this cam is going to be able to move in relation to the exhaust. Now, when I have cam phasing on the intake, it's for performance. And when I have cam phasing on the exhaust, it's more for emissions. When I do both of these and I have a phaser on the intake and the exhaust, it gives me the best of both worlds. Now, this overlap period is going to allow me to lose vacuum. This will be referred to as an internal EGR system. When I have heavy overlap, you will have a loss of vacuum. Now, we all sort of already know this. When you have a performance cam and you hear the cam run, thump, 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 and when you rev it, it whum, whum, and then when it idles, it's very rough, thump, 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 and it just, you know right away that that is a performance style engine. Now, what's really happening in these type of engines is I have overlap. The more overlap, the worse they run at idle, and I got to raise my idle up just to make the car run. Now, what is actually happening is when these have high flow and I've got a lot of volume moving through the engine being pumped, that means I have a lot of volume. And this volume has weight. We know that air has weight because we weigh it with a mass air sensor. Now, when the air is moving down in the intake into the cylinder for a charge, and I want more charge, what I can do is I can open the exhaust valve, and I can have the exhaust being scavenged. The piston is moving up, forcing the contents of the cylinder out the exhaust. Now, when I have a good volume as... I have volume by acceleration or weight by acceleration, that equals energy. So I have a lot of energy in that air mass moving out the exhaust. Now, when that air mass is moving out the exhaust very rapidly, it will actually make a siphon effect. Remember how when you take a hose and you put it in, uh, let's say we're siphoning fuel out of a tank and we suck on it and we drop the hose, now the weight of the liquid base will put a negative state of pressure at the other end and it will pull it out and it would be what we call a siphon. I can make a siphon effect the exact same way in the exhaust system. When I have a high volume under acceleration going out the exhaust and I open the intake, I will actually pull a negative state of pressure in the chamber and that will help the intake establish flow. So in high performance engines, that's what we're doing. Large overlaps will give me this ability to help pull the charge in from the intake and get it started by using the exhaust. Now the problem with that is, is I'm taking raw fuel and I'm putting it out the exhaust so my emissions would never, we could never get a car to pass the federal test procedure because we would have too much hydrocarbon leaving the motor. So on a racetrack, that's not important, but on the street, that becomes critical for the OEs to make these federal mandates. So I can't have a lot of overlap at idle, but what I can do is I can have this, this position of the intake move. Now at light throttles, just off idle and light type throttles and cruise, I can gift you a lot of overlap and the overlap will decrease the pressure in the, in the intake side. The more vacuum that I pull against, the more parasitic loss I have. It's called the suction throttling loss. And the suction throttling loss takes energy away from the engine. 
In order to get better fuel mileage, I add overlap by phasing the cam. And what that does is now I don't have that high volume moving out the exhaust where I have a lot of energy. So when the intake valve opens, the system gets confused because I don't have all that volume moving at a high velocity out the exhaust. Now is what's going to happen is I don't start a siphon effect. And so the exhaust that's inside the chamber is pushed back up into the intake. Now this is an EGR effect. This is referred to as internal EGR. And we all know an EGR valve, when I open the EGR valve open, what do you know happens? I lose vacuum. So when I'm testing EGR valves, when I open them, I expect them to drop eight to 10 inches of vacuum. So if I had 18 inches at idle and I open the EGR all the way up, I would expect it to go to 10 to eight and the engine will hardly run. And I have lost the vacuum. Well, at a lighter, at light throttle, I don't have to worry about the engine dying. So I can open this up, get a lot of overlap, reduce the intake pressure. In other words, I don't have as much vacuum there. And once I don't have as much vacuum, I actually can get better fuel mileage. Now, additionally to this, I can phase these cams when I've got these phasing systems. And now I can also get the same uh, type of performance that I can from a race car when I start to raise the RPM and I start to have a high volume, high velocity flow. And now I can start to actually get some gains out of this to produce power. So that's sort of what phasing is, is indicated above. Now, when I take this cam card that we looked at before and we have the exhaust cam opening, and this is the duration across the bottom in degrees, and going up is the how far I've opened the valve off of its seat. So this is my lift up to a half an inch in this application. Now, what I wanted to do is I wanted to put a compression tower where we can see top dead center and we come down and we can see where this valve opened and I have a state, a change of pressure in the combustion chamber. And basically we come up to atmosphere and we open this intake valve and we pull it down into a negative state of pressure. We close the intake and immediately the piston is moving up. So we start to build pressure and we come up to top dead center. And this is top dead center. So this is just an indication on a cam card to give you a better idea of how that waveform is made. Now the best way to understand pressure changes within a sealed system such as a cylinder, best understood by Broyles Law. So Broyles Law would state that a negative state of pressure contained within a sealed system, the higher pressure on the outside is trying to get into the lower pressure. So a low pressure having lower force and a higher pressure having higher force, the higher force will always go to the low pressure area. If I have this inverted and now I put a higher pressure in the sealed system, it's going to try to be getting out of the sealed system because a higher pressure has a greater force and this is a lower force on the outside. Again, this is dealing with sealed systems. If I took this jar and I opened this lid and I let the atmosphere get into this jar inside here, this is atmosphere. Now the inside, the outside and the inside both would have the same pressure. If I have the same pressure, I would have a zero pressure. Now, if I change the air temperature, I'll change the density of the air. So basically, as I get a colder, I have more dense. And if I get hotter, I get less dense. Now, basically, between minus 40 to 104, this is over a 35% difference. So there's a lot of difference in how much air volume is going to be within the sealed system just by heating or cooling it. The reason that the air expands when heated is that the heat energy causes the air molecules to vibrate or they start to move faster. And when they're moving, the particles take up more space and that's less dense. When I cool it, then we start to condense or it contracts.
And it's for the exact opposite reason as when it gets hot, it expands. Now we're contracting it and the particles don't have as much energy. So they're not moving. They, the colder it gets, the less they move. So once I get them really cold, they're closer together and they're more dense. Now, if I take this sealed system that we had earlier and we added at zero, but now we cool the inside of this vessel. Now this will condense and it will pull into a negative state of pressure. It pulls into a vacuum. And for the exact opposite reason, if I heat the inside of this chamber and we start to have these molecules vibrating really quickly and moving around in this jar, it ends up getting more pressure or I go from a, pos a zero to a positive state of pressure. Now be aware that this same type of system that I'm describing is used on your fuel out handling and containment systems, your EVAP systems. When I want to check for a leak, let's say under natural decay, this would get hot. And as this heats up and the air or the gas in the tank is heated, it expands. Now, if I shut the engine off and the car sits there, it's going to cool back down. And as it cools back down, it's going to condense. So it pulls into a negative state of pressure. Now, if I watch this with a sensor as I shut the engine off and I'm watching the pressure change inside the fuel tank and I went from a positive pressure and over time as it cooled down, I went into a negative state of pressure, it would show me that I didn't have a leak. If I was positive and I shut it off and I couldn't get far enough negative, it's indicative that there's a leak in that system. This is referred to as natural decay rates. And this is some, something that they use. So to understand Broyles' law is very important in more than in cylinder testing. This is done all over the car. So Broyles' law says the absolute pressure exerted by a given mass of an ideal gas is inversely proportional to the volume it occupies if the temperature and the amount of gas remains unchanged in a closed system. That sounds complicated. Let's decomplicate this. We all know what a bicycle pump is. If I have the piston pulled all the way up and I increase the volume here, when I increase the volume, I decrease the pressure. Now, if I push this handle down, in this case, and I have a very small volume area, I have a high pressure output. So a large volume is a low pressure and a small volume is a high pressure. They're inversely proportional. Now, what I really want you to start to think about at this time is all of these pressures, all pressure is a volume change. So you have to change volume to have any pressure change. Now, that's a really important fact. So when you look at pressure, really what you're seeing is the state of volume. And this would be for any type of a closed system. So in other words, the volume changes and the pressure follows the volume changes. So again, what we really need to start thinking about is going on in these uh, internal combustion engines and looking at these readings is I'm having volume state changes. And as the volume state changes, that's what's happening. Now, if I took this and sealed this system and I moved the piston down, I increased that volume. This volume increased right now. Now, this is lower. So now that I moved it down, I had more volume, less pressure. Now, if I go back to the same place I started, I have the same pressure I had before. Now, if I in decrease the volume, I'm going to go higher and the pressure goes higher. Now, if I remove the piston back down to the starting point, I'm going to go back to a zero point or the same pressure I started at. Now, this is extremely important because this is what happens in a cylinder. If I have a certain volume that's inside this, this sealed system and I compress it, and I move it back down to the same position it started, I have to go back to the same pressure. 
If it leaked, when it leaks, then I have something else happen. Now when I come up and this piston is moving up and I have a leakage out here and I leak, well then what happens is I lost volume. Now when the piston goes back to the same position, it will have less pressure than when I started with. That would be indicative of a, of a leak. And we'll see this as I go through this class, but you really need to understand this. So if the volume or the matter inside the sealed system does not change, the pressure won't change. So the only way that that's going to change is if I have a volume change. So if I pressurize the system and it goes up and I leaked and I return, I will have less pressure or I'll go into a negative state of pressure. So what Broyles law really states is it's just saying the pressure and volume equal the constant or the state of matter. If the state of matter in the sealed system stays constant, then these relationships will always come back to each other. If the constant changes, these will change. And we have one other factor that will have a play in this, and that's the temperature. And we've covered that already. We'll see how this actually works in a cylinder shortly. So the engine strokes, the intake, compression, power, and exhaust, we're all familiar with already. So the intake is where the piston was up at the top, close to the head, and the piston starts to move away from the head. Now that is increasing the volume, and that's going to give me a negative state of pressure. If I open this intake valve up, while well, the piston is moving down, a higher force from atmosphere will rush into a lower force because higher for higher pressure, atmosphere pressure is higher than in cylinder pressure, and the pressure difference will cause the, the higher pressure to go and fill or charge the cylinder. Once the cylinder is charged, now the piston starts its upward movement. So we went down to the low state, and now the piston is coming up and it starts to take this area, just like the pump we saw, and it starts to have a lower volume. Now, when I decrease the volume, I increase my pressure. Now, this is the compression that's going to happen. Now, the compression is going to heat the air charge, and this is going to be referred to as adiabatic compression. Adiabatic compression means that I didn't lose any energy that I put into the air from heating it. In other words, the temperature happens so rapidly. The, think about this. The piston is moving, and it moves extremely fast, just in milliseconds. Now, I trap that air, and the kinetic energy of the piston moving up hits those molecules of air, and as the piston's moving up, those air molecules bounce off of the piston. The faster the piston moves, the more energy I have to bounce those air molecules that are in the cylinder off the piston. These air molecules now go and they hit each other. And when they hit each other, they, they start to vibrate. And this vibration, they start to get hot. The vibrating molecules will produce heat. Now, the heat is put into the air so fast in just the stroke. And, you know, it. So we got to talk about this. A stroke at idle, you have a 150 milliseconds for two crank revolutions. You divide that by four to get your strokes. If I'm going down the road at 3,000 RPM, then you're going to have about 40 seconds for a fire cycle or about 10 milliseconds a stroke. At 6,000 RPM, I'm going to have about 5 milliseconds a stroke. Now, we all know when we've been working on a car and we're working around a hot engine and I hit the exhaust with my hand, if I just touch it really quickly, I do not burn my hand because any type of heat energy takes time to go from one unit to another unit. Now, when this happens really fast in the air, 
it doesn't have enough time to transfer the heat into the metal components, the piston, the cylinder, the valves, the head, the spark plug, and so on. If you left it hot, like if I leave my hand on the exhaust, it will burn me. But if I hit it really quick, there's no time for heat transfer thermal energy to move. So the energy is kept in the air. That's why it's called adiabatic. Now, the reason I'm heating this air is so I can take the fuel stock and the fuel being part of the air because it's vaporized and the additional heat is going to help the fuel vaporize because the heat will move into the small, the very small globules or spheres of fuel that are in a liquid base that are in the cylinder. All fuel has to be vaporized before it can burn. Solids and liquids don't burn, so we need a vapor to burn. That means that the fuel, the liquid fuel stock, needs to take on heat. And when it takes on heat, it flashes or changes a, its state from a liquid to a vapor gas state. And once it's gas, it will burn. So that's the compression. And this compression here, this basically, this compression over here is going to give me heat. And I'm going to vaporize the fuel. And once it's all vaporized and I have an homogeneous mixture, that means that the air-fuel mixture everywhere in the chamber basically that I check it is basically e equal to each other. Now we have a spark event happen and when the spark happens I'm going to heat the fuel stock past its thermal limit. Now the spark makes thermal energy. The spark itself doesn't ignite the fuel stock. What ignites the fuel stock is there's a plasma channel and the plasma gets superheated and when it arcs across the plug, it starts the energy to be released from the fuel. That's the point of ignition, but that is not combustion. Now, the point of ignition is where I start the fuel to burn right around the spark plug. Now, combustion is where I start to propagate that fuel burning away from the plug and that's going to put heat into the air. Now the air is the nitrogen. So the air is my working fluid. The oxygen is my oxidant that I'm going to use during my chemical reaction to convert the hydrocarbons or the fuel and that's going to produce heat and the heat's going to push the piston down. Now once this burn takes place it's going to come down and now the valve is going to open before the piston gets to top dead center because I still have a lot of pressure in the cylinder. So I'm going to allow the valve to open early and that will help scavenge the higher pressure will now rush out the exhaust and now the piston's going to go over center and it's going to start to come up making a higher pressure in the chamber and a high pressure goes to a low pressure and this is going to be a scaven state where I'm forcing all the burned constituents out the exhaust. So that's my exhaust phase. Now an in-cylinder idle compression waveform is what we want to look at first. That's where this throttle blade right here is closed. That means I have a high pressure on the outside being that of atmosphere and I have a low pressure on the inside of the intake because the pistons are moving down against that throttle plate and that's going to move uh, an air mass. So this is a compression waveform, an in-cylinder compression waveform taken at idle. Now again, I'm going to stress that these are the rules that will apply to idle. Now we can see that we have the pressure coming up right here. That means that that piston is coming up during my compression stroke as we just talked about until it comes to A. Now at A, that's as close as the piston can come to the head, which we'll refer to as top dead center. We've already seen that as I have a, a volume change and I go from a large volume to a small volume, I make pressure. Again, the volume is changing and the pressure is following the volume changes. Always remember that all of these have to do with volume and the volume is changing. When you start to think about these in volume changes, it will be much easier to understand what's going on. Now, when the piston comes as close mechanically to the head as we can, we will have what we would call top dead center and that will be A. Now, for all practical purposes, this truly is top dead center. We will cover how this isn't, but for right now, we're going to call it top dead center. Always be aware 
that that is relative to the volume state within the cylinder where that peak pressure is. And I'll demonstrate this shortly to where you really understand that. But for our practical purposes, this is as close to top dead center, and this will be very close to top dead center also on a crank trigger wheel. Now, as the piston moves away from the head, we start to decrease the pressure by increasing the volume. As the piston moves away, I'm making more volume. So the pressure is following the volume, and I come down to a point where we're going to call B. Now, if I go from the center line, the TDC line, and I measure out to this point right at 30 degrees, and I half mass, I'm sorry, not 30 degrees. If I measure from peak down to here, and I go half mass, so if I measure from the top to the bottom of my waveform, and I cut this in half and I put a cursor through the half. Now is what I want to do is I want to measure this from this center line to this ramp, the upward ramp. This is the compression ramp. And this is the decompression ramp because I'm decompressing. I compressed on this side. I decompressed on this side. And I want to measure from this center line out to the decompression. Now, both of these ramps, I want both of these ramps to be within 20 degrees. On this particular example, you can see where I'm at a 30 degree mark half mast, and I'm a little over 30 degrees on this. Now, what that tells me is that I don't have mechanical issues. When I have, and you can still have mechanical issues and not have leaning ramps, and I'll show you this. But what we're interested in right now is when we first look at this tower, if they look even at idle, that means that I don't have an immediate problem that I can see. When one of these ramps, like if this ramp came way up over here, this is way wider and the ramp would look like it's leaning. A leaning ramp is always indicative of a mechanical failure within the engine. So basically, if I measure from B and M, and I'm measuring half mast to the top dead center position, this is telling me if, the, if these towers are even. When these towers start to become uneven, it's just indicative that there is some type of a mechanical failure or a volume change within the cylinders, what that's showing me. As the piston continues to move away from the head, I continue my downward movement until I get to C, which is my 90 degree. This is 30, 60, 90, and C will be at the 90 degrees. And if we go over to this side, we've got L, and this is 30, 60, 90, and this is a 90 degree position. Now, if we look at the 90 degree position, there's something that happens that's very interesting here. So it, this is, if this is atmosphere through this exhaust plateau, and I measure, and we measure half, halfway, so this is the 90, and this is atmosphere to the bottom of my ramp, and halfway up, we're going to put a line through here. And this line through here now is going to be an indication of how this ramp down is being made and how this ramp up is being made. Notice that these ramps right here, halfway, and halfway and halfway. This is all real equal and it's really being made very uh, conformative. Now any leak in this system is going to change this position and this position. In other words, this waveform is going to change with leakage. So if we have a good cylinder without leakage, then I can use these positions right here for cam timing and again over here and here. So these are some good points for me to realize what's causing that. And so now that we're at C or L and we're at E and H, I can see that if I took a line that these are all going to be very equal and by where they cross in my my gridding down here will give me some indications on my valve pockets and leakage both. Now as I continue to go down and I get to D, the valve opens. This is the exhaust valve opening. And I can see where if I drew a drawing and I drew down to right here, I'd have a change. This is, do you see how I drew a line and I drew a line? This needs to have a point of definition in it. 
A point of definition means that I can clearly see where that valve opened. If this whole pocket is totally rounded, the exhaust valve is not seated. So we want a point of definition or a point I can see where this ramp and this ramp have a changing point, a point of change. And that's really important. Now, I got a question for you that will need to be answered. And that is, if the piston is still moving down, because D is going to happen on the engine between 30 and 50 degrees. That is a rule of thumb. And I want to stress that that's a rule of thumb. Some engines will be at 60 degrees. Like if we had a Chevy 5.3, that valve pocket will be at 60. Most engines are going to be between the 30 and 50 point. And again, these are rule of thumbs. And depending on which engine we have, these might change. But I need rules of thumb so I can use this in everyday applications. Now, if I'm, in, I'm at, say, 50 degrees and we have a change here, the piston is still moving down until I get to bob, bottom dead center. That means I'm increasing the volume, which should be decreasing the pressure. But I have a rising pressure rate here. So the question is, how can I have a rising pressure here where I'm rising the pressure, but the volume is still decreasing because I'm going from top dead center to bottom dead center, and I should be decreasing the pressure. But here, as soon as the valve opens, I'm increasing. In order to understand this, I want to jump over to the other side of the waveform. As we've talked about, this exhaust plateau will be somewhere at atmosphere. Now, if I have atmosphere and I open the intake valve, and the piston is moving down, I'm increasing the volume within that chamber, meaning I'm decreasing the pressure. If I there, Remember, pressure and volume are inverse. So if I move the piston down, I go into a negative state of pressure. Now, that would be vacuum, right? This is atmosphere. This is how much vacuum I have, or a negative state. So this is in a vacuum over here. I close the intake valve. And then we pressurize that volume. Whatever volume states in there gets pressurized. Now, if this is in a vacuum state, remember the illustration we had of the hypodermic with a gauge on top, and we said that it had to return to the same pressure. So if this is a vacuum over here, and I sealed the chamber, and I pressurized it, and I come back down, well, when I come back down, it had to return to the same pressure as here. Now, what this means is right here, this is now in a vacuum. So if I open the valve and the cylinder is in a vacuum and I have a higher pressure with more force and atmosphere, that's going to rush into the tailpipe. So actually what's happening is when I open the exhaust valve, the atmosphere rushes into the tailpipe and it's filling the cylinder, and as I'm filling the cylinder, I'm changing the volume, and I get this upward rise. Now, this upward rise now will become very important to dealing with cam timing, because depending on where I open this valve is going to depend on how fast I can get the atmospheric air to rush in. So what I'm looking for is this ramp rise, and where this ramp crosses this bottom dead center mark is going to give me a very good indication of cam timing. So rule of thumb, about halfway up the ramp into the top of the ramp, I want this, this pink bottom dead center mark. Usually on most modern engines, it's going to fall towards the top of this ramp. So I'm going to check this point here, and I want it roughly between 30 and 50, rule of thumb, it can go to 60. The engines don't usually go more than 60. And when I open that, it has, it has the fact that when I open this, this atmosphere rushes into the cylinder and I make this rising ramp. And this rising ramp will come into the exhaust plateau. Now, this exhaust plateau is atmosphere. So how fast this rises has to do with when the valve opens. So again, the bottom dead center mark needs to be somewhere above the halfway mark into the top ramp into here. And if that mark is following into this position, that's telling me that that cam is 
is close to time, and this means it's close to time. So I can actually check my cam timing here. So E is about halfway up the ramp. Now, this bottom dead center mark, if it falls down in the bottom of the pocket and this whole exhaust is to the right of the bottom dead center mark, this is to the right, then it's retarded. Right on a scope is retarded, and if it moves to the left, it's advanced. So the further over this comes to the left, it's advanced, and the further it is to the right, it's retarded. Now this works for all your waveforms on an oscilloscope. So if I'm looking at ignition timing or I'm looking at cam timing, such as with a cam target wheel against a crank target wheel, if it's to the right, it's retarded, R&R, and, R. and it's to the ed if it's to the left, it's advanced or it's early. Now, once I rise up and I get this into the atmosphere state and we get these ripples, I don't want you to get too concerned with these ripples because once the exhaust valve has opened here, I'm in fluid communication with the exhaust system. In other words, the chamber and the exhaust are one unit and I can change pressures in and out of the chamber with the exhaust because the exhaust valve is open. So this can be from the other cylinders pushing and bouncing waveforms. Always remember in the exhaust, you have a lot of hot burning fuel and so on that makes a turbulent activity in the exhaust. So to have these ripples, don't worry about those. These ripples are very normal and they change engine to engine until they get very high. We're not going to worry about that. Now, if I'm at a zero plane right here, and this is zeroed, at the point that this, this, this average is higher than about 4 PSI higher than zero, it's indicated that I might have an exhaust restriction, something like a, an restrict or restriction. But to check the exhaust restriction, I really want to do this another way. I want to do that during a snap test, and I will cover that during this course. But I just want to make sure that you're aware that it should be close to zero. When it gets over, you know, four or five PSI, that's a heavily restricted exhaust. And if it's down towards a zero plane, remember at idle, I don't have very much volume going through the engine. If you look at your mass air sensor, and let's say I have a five liter engine and I have about five grams of air moving through that engine to overcome the parasitic loss of that engine, that's what the gram weight should match the liter size of engine as rule of thumb. So if I have a five liter hot unloaded idle, I'm going to flow about five grams of air. But when I rev that motor, I might have 180 or 200 grams of air moving. The volume increases and that makes it easier to push against the exhaust. So really to look at this exhaust, I want to snap the throttle and I want to have a high volume going out and then I'm going to check the pressure. I will cover that and I will show you how that's done before we end this class. Now I'm going to come over close to top dead center. Now most of the valve systems will open right before top dead center, but some of them open after top dead center. Now when the intake opens, I'm going to have this drop. And when the intake, remember, I have atmospheric pressure because the exhaust valve is open and we have the overlap phase that we've already discussed. Now the exhaust is going to be open and the intake is going to be open and that's the overlap that's going to occur right here. Now on street type cams, I have very small overlaps so I have a stable idle and I can control my emissions. So that might be why we phase cars and some cars might not be phased and we're just going to always have a lower overlap period, but we will have an overlap period to where the, the exhaust valve and the intake are open at the same time right here. Now when the intake valve opens, it's going to take a drop because immediately when that intake drops, the pressure being higher is going to drop and it's going to pull this waveform down into the cylinder. Now I want this waveform, this, should, this drop should happen right around the TDC point, very close to TDC, and the whole drop should be completed by the 60 degree mark. If this goes all the way over to 90, it's taking too long, and again, that's indicative of a problem.
If I have an engine such as a Porsche or a Volkswagen with an isolated runner, a true isolated runner, this whole pocket will be very rounded because now I don't have the contents of the entire intake manifold volume helping hold this low. Always remember that the intake is being pulled into a negative state of pressure and I'm storing that energy. In other words, I have a very large area in the intake and it's being stored at a negative state of pressure. So as soon as I open the valve, the higher pressure in the cylinder, because we were, we were in a pressure state, I opened the valve up and now that pressure is going to have a change in the induction system and that's going to give me this drop. So immediately when I open the valve, I get a drop. Even though the piston's not moving yet, it will start to drop and that's because we're changing volumes between the intake and the cylinder. So now we're going to have this drop. I want it to happen by the for the 60 degree. Now this is the 30 degree mark and with non cam phasing on the intake, I want the 30 degree mark to be halfway up the ramp. So halfway up the ramp is right here and we can see that that's equal to this 30 mark right here. So that's going to be 30 degrees. Now if I have cam phasing, I want this to happen at 20 degrees after top dead center. So if I have a phaser and it's phased, you would go top dead center, we're going to go 20 degrees and the center of this ramp should be at that point. In other words, we should be about 20 degrees after we'll be into the ramp. So if this whole ramp is on this side of the TDC mark, it would be to the left, that means it's early or it's advanced. If this whole ramp is way over here, it moved to the right and it means it's retarded. For checking cam timing, I'm looking for non-phase cams to be halfway up the ramp, roughly or a little higher at 30. And if I'm phased, I want 20 degrees after top dead center and I want to be somewhere roughly halfway up the ramp to a little higher than halfway up the ramp. This is a good indication that I have a good timed engine. Now, I come across and I is usually right after the early pull is going to be my lowest position. Now D over here should never be lower than this intake pull at I or J. If D is lower than the intake pull, it shows you you had a leak. Again, when I compress the gas during the compression state and if I leak the gas or the volume out of the cylinder and I return to the same position, D will have less volume and less volume is more negative pressure. So if the exhaust pocket is deeper than the intake pocket, there's a leak present. That's what that's telling you. It's always a leak because you cannot change the volume from when I sealed it here this pressure needs to return to the pressure state that I sealed it with. If D is deeper or has more negative pressure than this intake, I have a leak. Now D also should not be higher, D up here being higher than the intake by more than 2 PSI. If D is higher than 2 PSI than the intake pull, it's indicating that I've got a leaks or I've got some kind of a valve timing issue and we'll cover this later in this presentation. So D should always be very close to I and J and J is just the average of the intake pull across here. So D and I and J should be the same. Very similar positions here. D should not be higher than 2 PSI and it shouldn't be any lower at all. If D is lower than the intake pull, then it's indicated there's some type of leakage occurring within the cylinder. I is just the pull. The piston is moving from top dead center to bottom dead center and I'm increasing the volume within that cylinder and I'm filling or charging that cylinder here. Now I want you to notice that at bottom dead center, the piston has already started to move upward to top dead center. Now, Right here at K is where the intake valve closes. If I follow this ramp down and right about there, I'm going to see where if I came across right here, do you see how there's a point right there that it changes? 
there is a point at K right here where this ramp coming down and this stays flat and as soon as the valve closes it starts to rise. Well that is the intake valve closing and I really want the intake valve to close between 60 degrees and 40 degrees. It's rule of thumb. Some engines will will close the valve at about 30, but all most cars will close it right at about 50 to 60. That's a real normal average rule. Uh, I, most of the engines I chuck, I'm closing that intake valve somewhere right around the 50-60 mark. I'm really looking, rule of thumb, between the 60 and about 40 degrees. If it closes right over here at Bob dead, bottom dead center and it immediately starts to rise as the piston is rising, it's showing you that we have a cam timing problem or a worn out lifter might be or a, a, a valve that's it's not opening on time. And that could be from a rocker arm that's worn, that could be from a cam lobe, that could be from a lifter. But when we have a late closing, let's say this guy came way over here and I open, and this opening should be early, but the opening is late, and the closing is early, it's showing me that something's worn here. So those would be the ways I might use this. Like if I had a low worn off a cam, I'm going to have a late opening and an early closing. Now something's wrong when you see that type of waveform. I should fall at the top dead center mark. This whole thing should be fall, should fully fall before the 60 mark. Usually by 45, they've totally fallen. I should come across pretty flat until I close the valve. When I close the valve, now immediately I have a rise. Now this valve closing will be very important for checking the cam timing along with the intake ramp. We always want to look at all of the data. I'm going to also look at the exhaust push and the intake pull, and I'm going to show you that later in this presentation. And I'm going to use those to figure out where these positions are as well. So I'm going to overlay these waveforms so I can fully understand my cam timing positions. Once I close this valve, it starts to rise. Now I want you to notice that this stayed flat until it closes the valve and then I get the rise. The reason that that stays flat is the intake volume. So the intake manifold is under a very high volume state and during this really high volume in the intake manifold is what I have in this position is a large negative state and it acts like an accumulator and even though the piston is moving up it holds the pressure in the cylinder and it equals the intake pressure because this is the intake pressure. So if I measure a median or the zero position here and I measure the bottom of this ramp, that's the, the my vacuum. That's how much vacuum is in the cylinder and in the manifold. So if you had, if you measured from here to here and I had 10 pounds, the conversion is 2.039, two times. So if I had 10 pounds, I'd have 20 inches of mercury. 10 PSI, these are PSI sensors, so double it. Whatever you would measure from here to here, we're going to double. So if I had 7 pounds, I'd have 14 inches of mercury, roughly. So that's a good way to measure this and to get your vacuum readings off of this waveform so I could tell what my vacuum is. Once I close the valve, it immediately starts to rise until I get to L. And again, L is at the 30 or the 90 position, 90 degree position, 30, 60, 90, and that L is right at that position. Now, I continue the piston up and I start to make pressure. Now, be aware that all the way over here, right here, is at a zero plane. So that I'm just coming back to atmosphere. So if we look at this waveform and we came up at the 30, do you see that almost the entire pressure of this ramp is made from 30 degrees? So in the last 30 degrees of movement, which is the smallest amount that will be made in the cylinder. In other words, as I compress the gas and I'm rotating the piston, the piston is slowing down. 
The piston was stopped basically at the bottom dead center point and it accelerated to its highest point at the 90 degree point and then it deaccelerates until it gets to the top dead center point and then it starts to move down. But there is a momentary position, we'll say, where the piston didn't move. Well, if I look at this 30 point, most of the pressure in this waveform is made after the 30 position. Now, this is why if I have volume changes occurring in the cylinder, in other words, I got leakage, this point at top dead center will be going up and down. It will be up and down. And that's, we'll look at this, but we're looking for one that's high, one that's low, and then the next one being high. That's a high, low, high, and that's indicative that I've got a leakage, and we'll look at that. But what I'm interested in is I, you need to really understand this. At the very end of the piston movement towards the head is where most of the pressure is made. So any kind of volume loss is going to really affect this type of a position to where I just don't get my peak pressure. So this is the idle waveform that we've covered thus far. Now what we want to do is we want to have the idle to where we've got the throttle plate closed and now we snap it open and we get a wide open throttle. Now what this does is I have a high atmospheric pressure and I have a low internal uh, manifold pressure. When I open the throttle up, the outside air being at a higher pressure will rush into the intake manifold and it will start to have a very high cylinder charge rate. And that's what we want. We want a real high charge rate. So now this is a waveform. And usually when we get these type of waveforms, we want to always get somewhere about uh, 40, 50 seconds is a real good amount of information to save. So I start the car and I can see that this is my crank. We have not covered that yet, but I will in just a moment. Once I crank, the engine starts and it starts to move faster and since it's moving faster, I'm pulling against the throttle valve. When I pull against the throttle valve, I pull the cylinder into a negative state of a vacuum. And when the cylinder is in a negative state, it doesn't have the same volume in it. Remember, if the pressure went down, if the pressure was up here at 140 pounds, and at idle, it basically dropped to 45, 50 pounds, I had to have a volume change. Volume changes and pressure follows volume. So the volume changed, and the reason the volume changed is because I'm pulling against the throttle blade right here at idle. Now, when I start and I snap the throttle, I immediately have this increase in pressure. And that is due to I'm allowing volume to get into the cylinders and have a higher charge rate of those cylinders. Now, when I let off of the throttle, the engine is revving, and when the engine is revving, it goes back down here and we go all the way back down. And this is a really high negative state of pressure or vacuum. The engine might be revving at 3000 RPM, 3500 RPM, and I snap the throttle blade closed. So this is going to be a really good position to look for leaks down here in my D cell. And I'll show you that. Now, once I have the D cell, I'm going to come up and we return to an idle. I always want to look at how long it took to recover. Do you see how this is the same pressure as I had here? If this takes a really, really long time to recover, there's something wrong. We should, as soon as the engine RPM starts to come back down, I'll start to stabilize and we'll recover. If this doesn't recover or we have a real high recovery and down, these are all indications of, of something not working quite right. Normally, when I snap the throttle, I'm going to have a high increase in pressure, and then I decel and I'm going to have a low volume because I have high vacuum in the cylinder, and that means low volume, and then we're going to recover to a normal state again. So we always want to look at the waveforms over here and over here, do several different places in this waveform when we're checking for cam timing or leakage. Don't look at one place only. We want to look at multiple places in these waveforms. When I want to look at my exhaust for being plugged, I want to look over in here when I snap it. We will cover all of this during this presentation.
So now this is my idle right here and I'm coming across and I've got about 45, 41 pounds. Now what I want to do is I want to look right here at this peak and this peak and this peak. And it's what I'm looking for is one of these to be high and then low and then high. And if I've got high, high, low, high, that tells me it's leaking. The reason that that says it's leaking is because this is happening in roughly about 150 milliseconds makes a complete fire cycle or two crankshaft revolutions. In this position, then that would be 150 milliseconds. Now I can't open and close the, the idling system, whether it's an IAC motor or the throttle valve that quickly to let air in and to not let air in. So when you start to get high, low highs, always be aware that that would be an indication of a leak. Now, if the engine is rolling, it's surging, these are gonna come up and down as it's rolling. And I don't wanna look at the roll, so if I'm coming in and I'm decreasing, 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 decreased, increasing, 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 that's not a high, low high, that's a surge. And many engines during when I'm looking at them, they're not running that well anyway. And now I've taken a cylinder away from being activated because I've taken the spark plug out. Another thing that I will caution you is when you take the spark plug out of the engine, one, make sure that it's grounded, but two, make sure there's not a secondary spark plug. If I have a spark occurring in the cylinder from a secondary plug, you'll have a really unusual waveform and you can damage the pressure transducers from the additional heat and pressure under a snap condition. So we always want to make sure that we're not firing fuel. We want the fuel to be at a state to where it's not being fired. That means no spark in the, in the system and then we won't have that. So now that we have this, I'm going to look for high, low highs along here. And when I snap this, remember this whole plateau was made in vacuum. I pull this cylinder into a vacuum and I close the valve. And when I close the valve, I pressurized the contents or the matter in the cylinder. So whatever that is, is how high a pressure I have. That's the volume. And then I'm going to decrease again. And now I decrease. Now this came back into a vacuum. This was a vacuum and this is a vacuum. Now, the atmosphere is here, and it rushes into the cylinder here, and this exhaust plateau is being made strictly by vacuum. Now, if I snap the throttle, do you see how that goes away? I no longer have this exhaust plateau when I snap it. If I snap the throttle, and it's under wide open throttle, and I have this looking waveform like this, where I have a plateau, that will be a pressure plateau, and it also shows you or indicates that the exhaust is restricted. So if I have the plateau during a snap event over here, it's going to show me that I have a plugged exhaust. When I snap the throttle, I should not have a pressure state over here. I should have like it looks like right here. There's just not much right here. If I have a rise with a a pressure plateau, this is a vacuum plateau. If I have a pressure plateau, it shows that something is restricting the scavenging or when I put that, I'm, I'm putting the exhaust, the burned exhaust gas out the tailpipe. So when I snap it, I'm gonna lose vacuum. When I lose vacuum, since this whole plateau was made by vacuum, that's gonna go away and now this is pressure based. This isn't a vacuum or a negative state of pressure. These are pressure states. And the next thing I want to look at is right here. If I had 41 pounds and I go up to basically within the first few hits, the first three, four hits, I want to go three times the idle. Now three times the idle is just saying that I want about three times the idle. Now that's relative guys. So you got to think about this. All of these figures I'm showing you are, you got to think about and you got to use your own intelligence to get this. Now, if the engine was running very poorly and the throttle valve is open trying to hit the target idle. So let's say that the throttle is normally at 10% opening, but now it's at 30% opening trying to make the engine run at 800 RPM.
this is not going to be a 41 PSI. Now, now I'm going to have like 80 or 100 pounds. Now, anything more than 100 pounds at idle, I start to become concerned about. Because if I have more than 100 pounds of pressure at idle, how did the volume get into the cylinder? If I have an idle and I've got 180 pounds of pressure in the cylinder during idle, I have a lot of volume in there. Now, maybe a plug or a hose is off the intake and it's a big loss, so I have a lot of volume entering. Another way I can have this happen is from the cam timing. If the cam timing has a whole lot of overlap because the cams are out of time, I will have 150, 190 pounds of pressure in the cylinder and I'm getting the air from the exhaust side back in through the exhaust and that will give me very high pressures. My target is somewhere about 40 to 70 pounds on most motors. As long as I'm under 100, I'm not real worried. When it starts to become over 100 pounds, I want to know how I got so much volume in the cylinder that that's affecting it. Now, when I snap the throttle and I have 41 to 167, I have more than a three times increase. And that's really what I'm looking for. This is relative, guys. Always remember, this is relative. So if this is a relative position, then that's what I'm talking about. So in this position, what I want you to think about is if the engine isn't running very well and the throttle is letting more air in to try to stabilize or target the idle program state, this could be higher and I'm not going to get three times. It won't happen. So I'm looking for three times and that's relative. Again, I want to make sure you understand that if I'm allowing more volume and you won't get this. This is on a normal style engine, I see this type of thing. On one that's running really bad or the cams are out of time, you won't get this and it doesn't mean it's bad. And we will look at this as we proceed through the course. So this is a snap normal flow. So I'm going to put a cursor through the peak and put a cursor through the peak. I'm going to mark it. And now what I see is I see this compression waveform. Now, during snap, I am not looking for half mast, where I would look here to here, and I'm going to measure from this ramp to this ramp half mast. You cannot do that during a snap. That is during an idle position, not a snap. Many of these snaps will look like the towers are leaning or they're warped. I'll have a real wide one on this side, and that's normal. On this particular waveform with a normal flow, these are pretty even, but don't look for how even they are. That's not a, a thing we do on snap. Now, what I am looking for is to have a very low waveform down in the middle here. And then we're going to come over and we're going to close the valve and we're going to rise. During the snap flow rate down in here, we do not check cam timing. Cam timing with those ramps, the exhaust plateau ramps is only done at idle when I have more than 5 PSI of vacuum. If I don't have more than 5 PSI, I can't use the ramps, so then I'm going to use the valve pockets. But in this particular waveform right here where I snap it, we do not look at valve opening and closings. We see our peak pressures and we see if we have high low highs as we increase the ramping. So here is a high flow system and we can see how I came up and then we warp down. Or do you see how wide this is compared to this? And when we say a, when we talk about a normal flow or a high flow, what we're really talking about isn't an overhead engine. So we could say that a cam that's overhead would be a flat high flow, but that may not be true. A normal flow engine and a high flow engine have to do with the structure and the geometry of the port area. If I make the port smaller, I can have a higher velocity and that will give me a higher cylinder charge rate or I have more cylinder filling at around 3000 RPM to 4000 RPM. So most drivers that are driving their cars do not go at wide open throttle. One of SAE's statistics is, is an engine will work at under 50%, under 40% throttle for most of its life, for less than, for 
90% of its life will be less than 40% throttle opening. And we are know that's true. When we're driving a car, we're less than 40% throttle for most of the application. Getting on the freeways, we're accelerating and we're wide, we're have a wider open throttle than that target. But when we're cruising, we're usually below 40%. And when we're driving around town where most people are driving, we find that the targets are even less. So if I have a smaller port area and I can increase the velocity of air, remember it's like a river. So when you come to high rapid areas in a river, it goes into a canyon. That same area of water has to speed up to get through the canyon and I have high uh, rapids there. That's where white water exhibits. Where the river is really wide and I can stretch the volume out, I slow the flow down. So in an engine, it works similar. So if I have a big, huge port at low RPM, there's not enough velocity to help charge, so I need to rev the engine higher to make power. Now, a uh, normal flow and a high flow is really referring to the port and the combustion geometry, and that's going to help charge that cylinder. So if I have a soccer mom's car, I want it to have a high torque value in where in the area where it's being driven between two and four thousand RPM. If I have a BMW, I didn't buy a soccer mom car. I bought a rocket ship. I want the car to pull hard. So I want a large port to where it's going to pull hard up into the six seven thousand range, and that will produce more power for me. So the engineering teams are going to look at who's buying the car, who am I designing the car for, and these will be design constraints. So again, high flow and low flow or normal flow heads, that doesn't necessarily pertain to an overhead cam or not an overhead or, you know, an over valve engine. I mean, usually we put the cams overhead and we have better performance from those engines, but there's more involved in all of this. And there's also swirl valves and all these other things to try to speed up the airflow at lower RPMs and then move the valving system at higher RPMs so I get the best of both worlds. So there's lots of things that can come into a factor here. Now, once I let off, this is the D cell. Now, this is the compression ramp here, and this is the exhaust ramp. This is the compression ramp, and this is the exhaust ramp. If the compression ramp is equal or lower than the exhaust ramp, you have a problem. Things like flat lobes and low worn rockers, I will have less pressure because I didn't let the volume in under D cell because the valve isn't opening far enough. Now normally, a rule of thumb from the exhaust pocket to this, I want at least a seven pound increase from, from the exhaust to here. And in many cases, I'll have 20 or 30. Again, 30 pounds difference. But what, again, this is relative, right? to what I'm doing, what kind of engine, what vacuum I have, but they should never be equal to this. We should always have a higher compression than we do on the exhaust. When we don't, that's indicative that I have some type of a charge problem. When the exhaust is higher than the compression, the exhaust is higher because we're getting pressure into the cylinder from the exhaust, not the intake. And we should always have a higher flow in during the induction system. And again, that is indicative of things like worn rockers, worn lobes, things like that, valve timing errors. So these should always be higher by about seven pounds or more. I mean, many times they're 30 pounds higher during D cell, but they shouldn't be equal to or less. So here's my D cell. And again, I'm marking it. And we never look at cam timing during this event. I will show you what happens shortly during these D-cell events and the timing structure will not be correct. We want to look at a crank. So we're going to now do a cranking engine with a no start. So to do this, we do not want to open the throttle wide open to clear flood. When I open the throttle wide open, I am going to have a problem. 
And the problem is going to be that I will not have the negative state of pressure pulling against the throttle valve. I want the throttle valve to close during cranking. That will give me my highest pressure differential within the cylinder so I have a better way to read my pressure waveforms or the intake pulls. I'll show you this when we get there. But in this case, right now, I want to pull, I want to unplug the coils. I take a coil fuse out, take the fuel pump relay out. And if I take the fuel pump relay out as I'm cranking it, it cannot still be getting fuel. Like it's going, this is a steady state I crank. No try to start. It needs to be a steady crank. And if it's a steady state, I will have good patterns. If it's trying to start, those aren't good patterns because now I have a velocity change from the piston moving faster and I'll have more pressure. So this is cranking with the throttle plate closed. I'm going to disable something to get this. I always want to get maybe 10 seconds, eight, 10 seconds. And again, first thing we're doing is looking for high, low highs up here, where I have one high, one low, one high. And in this case, I don't see this. This is a pretty steady state across here. Now what we want to do is we want to take the zoom window and zoom in on this so we have a better waveform so we can mark it. So we've zoomed in. We now mark through each peak. And we have our grid up. Now, in this grid, we now don't have the ramps that we can do for timing. So during this state, we will not look for cam timing on these ramps because you need more than 5 PSI, 10 inches of vacuum to have a good steady ramp to where we can really use those ramps. Now, at idle, I normally have 1 to 3 pounds of pressure, so again, we just really don't have enough vacuum to use ramps. But what we do have are these pockets. So we have this pocket where the exhaust valve opened and we can see where the intake valve closes. Now, again, we want to see the pressure coming up to top dead center. And we have 130 pounds on this example. Now, you have to have more than 100 pounds of pressure to have enough temperature or thermal energy contained within the cylinder to vaporize the fuel to start it. You always, always look up the book because some of these engines aren't what you think. When you're looking at a Mazda Sky Active, you could have way more pressure than you ever would have thought. And some of these don't have even a reading. They just say that they need to be more than 100 pounds and they need to be within 30% of each other. So it just depends on the manufacturer and the type of engine, but we always want to look these up. Now, when we come up to peak pressure, now in the cranking waveform, half mass, so I want to measure from the top to the bottom, go halfway up and look at this. And what I'm interested in seeing is if these ramps are equal. So if the tower looks like it's leaning, you have a mechanical failure. If the towers are even, that's really good. It's indicating that that's a good thing. I don't want leaning towers during a cranking test. During a snap test and a decel test, they can lean. During an idle and a cranking waveform, I want the towers to be equal to each other. Once I come up and I check my peak pressure and I come back down, I want the towers to be even. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to continue to decrease the piston volume, the piston is going to be moving away from the head. And again, this is my top dead center point. And again, that's relative. For most of our testing, we'll say that is top dead center, although that has some variant. There is variant on the pressure transducer itself. Always make sure when you spec a pressure transducer that you have basically less than one millisecond of latency or delay in the pressure transducers. So we want to not have a lot of latency. The other thing is, is that idle, the top dead center point, is way more accurate than during idle or revving. And that's because during idle, we're going to have roughly a 500 to 600, 700 milliseconds of cycle time. So from peak to peak, I'm expecting half a second to more than half a second, uh, five to 700 milliseconds of time. 
On this one, we have 400 milliseconds, so this engine's actually cranking a little bit faster. At idle, I have 150 milliseconds. So I have more time to charge the cylinder here. So now, since I have more time and I've got good compression and good volume, I'll have a better accuracy of this top dead center position. So when we mark top dead center to top dead center, now what we want to do is we want to take a zoom window and we want to zoom in on this point down here so we can actually see what's happening here. So here, when we zoom in, we can see that we do have these structures down here. And again, we can see where this guy right here had a change. In other words, I actually changed the position. And right here where we change is where the valve opens. So that's my valve opening. And again, I want my valve opening. My target is from 30 to 60 when we're cranking. So rule of thumb is 30 to 60 during cranking. Now on the intake where I close over here, I also want 30 to 60. So you can, again, I can see this pressure change where I came across and then I went up and I change right here, and I want that to be between 30 and 60. And again, these rules of thumb, there's cars that don't follow these rules, but most cars will, and I've got to have some kind of rule to fix the car. Again, we do not use these ramps. There's no ramps. I did not have enough vacuum created in the cylinder during cranking to use those ramps. So cranking, I can actually be out a tooth, and I may not see it. Once the engine is idling, it's way better to get a good position to see where my cam timing really is. I have more points of reference to figure out if the cam is in or out of timing. Now at idle, if the car won't start, now I could be a tooth out and I might not see it. If I'm two teeth out, I'm going to see that and it's going to be easy. The reason I'm warning you about this is because of Nissan and Infinity products. Nissan and Infinity products, well, they do something a little different. What Nissan and Infinity do is if I'm a tooth or a little right around that point, I will fire a couple of injectors and some coils. And as soon as I see the cam come around with the crank and it's, it's a tooth out, I'll suspend starting the engine. I will no longer command the injectors and coils, so the car will not start. Most of the other manufacturers want the car to start, and they want to try to get the occupants to wherever they need to be. They don't want to strand them. Nissan and Infiniti's point is that if I, I'm over um, a tooth or greater out of time, I'm not going to allow the engine to start. If it jump timing and it's running, it will continue to run, but when you turn off the key and you try to restart it, You'll hear, like, as soon as you start to crank it, it will, whoa, 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 and it, then it will, whoa, 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 whoa. And when you watch it on a scope, you'll see several injectors fire and some coils fire, and then there's nothing. And those are indication on Nissan products that the cam timing might have an error. So I want to get the cam and crank sensor waveforms, and I want to compare those if I have those style problems. I'll also want to look at an in-cylinder waveform on, on any of the cars. It, it's another point of data that I'm going to need. So again, the exhaust opening over here is between 30 and 60, and the intake closing is also between 30 and 60 when I get my rise. Notice I came flat across and all at once I rose. That's where the valve actually closes. So that's how we're going to work those waveforms. Now is what we want to do is we want to apply what we've covered on a 2001 Honda Civic with a 1.7 liter VTEC engine. So what we want to do now is we're going to take a 10 minute break. So please watch your monitors and in 10 minutes we're going to get started.